So, we're going to talk about how to research for philosophy debate. So, first rule of philosophy debate. What is the best part of your case? Your framework. No! This is the mistake everyone always makes. If you're a philosophy debater, what do you want to have a debate about? Philosophy. The framework, right? Suppose you're an opponent, okay? And you're like, hmm, I'm hitting this person. The best part of their case is the framework, and they're really good at framework debate. But their contention's not that good. What are you going to invest your time answering? Contention. The contention. Assume your opponent... Huh? Should I, like, should, I, should I make it where like, it doesn't turn off? Yeah, that'd probably be good. Uh, thanks. Right, so, they, assume your opponent is calm, right? Like, I acknowledge, most opponents are bad at debate, right? Most people are really bad at debate. Like, like, to the point where, you know, most times I coach people at, like, at the end of the session, I'm like, well, what advice can I really give this person? And it's like, maybe I just have to tell them they're a non-academic extracurriculars. Maybe you should consider one. <laughs> like, yes, most people are bad at debate. This is just a fact. Nevertheless, you should prep as though your opponent's good at debate. And if you're going to prep as though your opponent's good at debate, then you know that your opponent is going to be somewhat intelligent. And so your opponent's going to see your case and be like, well, the framework is this quality, and the contention is this quality, and I'm going to invest my time answering the worst part of the case. So if you want to have a framework debate, and you want to align with have a framework debate, then you want the framework to be the weakest part of your case. Because you want that to be the thing that funnels your opponent into. Like... Cool. Uh, thank you. So, if you're trying to funnel your opponent to answering your framework, you need the contentions to be incredibly strong, and the framework to be like theoretically just super just kind of that. Now, this is not a lecture on how to do that. This is not going to be a lecture on how to write a framework and how to write contentions <coughs> that are super effective. I've got a really nice lecture on how to write a framework app. That's not this lecture. But nevertheless, if you're researching a philosophy debate, still, the central premise that your contention needs to be the best part of your case is still true. And that means good philosophy debate, unlike most philosophy debates, most philosophy debates are bad. Most philosophy debates are like a framework I read on every single topic, and I like know it so well, and like I can defend Kant against anything because I've been reading it for four years. And then my contention is some crap that causes the bail to talk about Kant that I forced to try to reform the gate. Any good opponent can be like, well, they've debated Kant for all four years of their time in high school, but their contention is crappy. Any common opponent is going to attack the contention. So, if you want to have a philosophy debate, you need to have an unbeatable contention to force your opponent to answer the framework. And so the first thing that you're trying to do, the way you start researching philosophy debate, is by coming up with contentions that you think are just like the true contention argument. Like, if this is all what we care about, I'm just going to win because this argument is not turnable. That's what you're after if you want to do framework debate. Just the unturnable contentions. Well, how do we do this? We start by going to JSTOR. So, well, okay. If the topic's first coming out, I don't start with philosophy debate, I start with general research. Right? So I start by going to Wikipedia, right? and I read the Wikipedia article on the topic, and I check some of the main bibliographies. Right? So I go to plato.stanford.edu and see if they have an article on the topic. And normally they don't, but sometimes they do. Right? So the topic is civil disobedience. They're like, ooh, there's a whole topic there. Right? That would be so useful. Um, but if it's most topics, right, like sex work, I assume there won't be an article. So I might read sex and sexuality at some point, but uh, this would not be the first, first thing I read. So I'm trying to find philosophy-based affirmatives or philosophy-based negatives. The first place I'm going to go is JSTOR. And the reason we start with JSTOR is because JSTOR has the best advanced search techniques for limiting down to philosophy articles. Click Advanced Search. And then what you do is you scroll down and you go to Narrow By and Limit to Articles, just because we're sensible people. And then you do return results for, and then limit yourself to disciplinary journals. So you come down, and you only look for philosophy articles. Okay? So you limit yourself to only philosophy journals, and then, once you've done that, you actually put in search terms of resolution. So someone pick a topic <coughs> that uh, we can like just practice with uh, for, ne for next year. How about the ecosystem personhood one? Because okay. Like yeah. Um, personhood, and then... Ecosystems. Right, so we can put this in and we can see. Ooh. And these all look pretty good. Um, yeah, so we can pull up and get two good articles. And what's nice about this is it limits it to philosophy journals, and so it tends to only be philosophers talking about it, which means you'll tend to find contention level arguments that are very principled and which are already going to have natural frameworks associated with them. Often these articles, in fact, will have contention and framework arguments all rolled into one, along with great footnotes for further places to look for framework debate. 
is the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use JSTOR and you're going to put in the central notions of the resolution. Similarly, right, suppose we take another one and this is the top you all been researching. So nuclear weapons, right, if we then limit ourselves to philosophy articles, click search. Nuclear weapons and world government. Oh, the cop card goes that's pretty good. Ghana is saying nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, no first Eastern European order. Chinese case against them. Yeah, these are all great. Oh, the Trans Day Health is a great article by Jeff McMahon. Um, this is a good article, the Questor article. This is a great article. No, actually, this is an okay article. This one's really good, the Allman article. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, like a lot of philosophers, especially Kant, kind of come under fire for having like, racist or problematic ideas. So, my guess is the opponent is going to attack that. Like, you know, Kant was a racist. So, how do you respond to that? Uh, so, not to relate to research, the general way I answer the argument, so how many Kantian philosophers someone says Kant had racist beliefs, they say, yeah, Kant did have racist beliefs, he had lots of racist beliefs, but so do I, and so do you, right, like, we all have really racist beliefs, like, a lot of our beliefs are impacted in very deep ways by racism, and if that's true, then this is a not effective strategy, well, someone has racist beliefs, just don't believe anything they say, because if you do that, you'd have to give up on all of your own beliefs, you have to say, like, I can no longer be a source of knowledge at all. But you can't take that approach to yourself, right? You have to think that what you have to do is, you know, inspect your own beliefs and critically assess which of them can be sort of fixed and which of them can't, right? We need to engage in a constant self-critical process since we all have our own racist beliefs about which of our beliefs can be salvaged and which cannot be. And that's a very difficult process to do. But if it's something we have to learn to do in our own lives, it's probably really, really useful to try to do it with really great thinkers whose ideas have been super influential who we have like hundreds of years of other people trying to do this exact same thing. So for hundreds of years, people have been trying to figure out what if Kant's beliefs were correct or not. And it's probably really valuable to try to work through Kantian philosophy in particular to try to figure out which of Kant's beliefs can be separated out from his racism and which cannot. Since that's something we have to do in our own lives, it's great to practice that with other great thinkers. And Kant would probably be an ideal person to try that attempt with. Yeah. Now, they all really great, like if the argument is, Kant's racism does impact his ethical claims, then that is a reason to reject the claims. But I don't think the fact that Kant is racist on its own would be sufficient to make that argument. The debater would have to have some positive reason to think that Kantian critical philosophy in general is not separable from this. And then I think there's just sort of interesting substantive debate, and I've got nice cards about how, you know, in fact, there's versions of Kantian ethics that is not sort of deeply influenced by his own racism. And so then this is a sort of substantive question. Um, yeah. But yeah, as far as like the general point, like Kant had bad beliefs, I think, yeah, but so do I. And if I can't just write off all of my own beliefs, I don't think I can just write off all of Kant's beliefs. I have to find some more productive and uh, critical way to move forward. Uh, so you start with JSTOR, okay? You've done this research in JSTOR, you've found some articles. Uh, other places to look for preliminary topic research, um, I tend to really like SSRN. I don't know why, it's like really not a philosophy-ish thing, but it tends to have some really nice principled-ish articles. It's just probably my favorite database for debate research in general, um, and tends to have good philosophy stuff as well. So I would always check out SSRN. Uh, it's a really nice place to look, and for some reason, a lot of framework cases end up with articles I found on SSRN to begin with. Um, so those are the two sort of databases I'll start with. After that, I will then check out a website known as Phil People, oh, sorry, Phil Papers. Um, Field Papers is an online research and philosophy database which just is designed to basically organize all philosophy articles and organize it. So there's a couple of things you should know here. First is the browse by topic area, which is really useful if you want to look up particular ethical theories. So maybe you know you want value theory, you want to like learn about particular normative ethical theories, so you click on normative ethics here. And then you can find out like, do you want to learn about consequentialism? Well, this person is subdivided. Articles on utilitarianism, acting more utilitarianism, varieties of utilitarianism, objections to utilitarianism, utility, well-being, utilitarianism, miscellaneous, varieties of consequentialism, agent neutral, and agent relative consequentialism, acting more consequential, right? And so like, maybe I want to know about maximizing the satisfaction of consequentialism. I can just click here, and this is edited by Douglas Portmore, one of the greatest consequentialists alive today, and he just maintains this with all the articles relevant to that topic. And so you can organize by these categories, and just find these curated lists, these lists curated by philosophers with all the relevant work in this area. Oh, like, so arguments of consequentialism, looks promising. Um, Kantian ethics, varieties of deontological moral theories, arguments for deontological theories, objections to deontological moral theories, topics of deontological moral theories, and so on. You can also search field papers. So there's two types of searches here. One is the search that will come up if you just be it. So if you like type in deontology, then you'll see these category drop downs. Okay, and this will be categories on these subjects. So, uh, consequentialism and deontology, right? Maybe I want to look up things about that. 
The other thing is I can just like use this as a classic search. So maybe I type in nuclear weapons, right? And there won't be a category search thing, but I can still search for articles published about philosophy in um, philosophy journal articles. And so it's another great place to just, basically it's the same thing as JSTOR, where JSTOR limits yourself to just philosophy articles. This also limits you naturally just to philosophy articles, but it's a little more curated and a little bit more professionally maintained. And so can include some other sort of useful stuff. After you check out those three, the next place I always look is Project Muse. Uh, and Project Muse I like because it's similar to JSTOR and then it allows you to limit by particular subject matters. So if I were to type in here nuclear weapons, I could search that and then limit um, to uh, okay. uh, limit it, sorry. Um, Language research area. So limit it. So if you go to research area, you can again limit it to just philosophy. Um, I think. A B C D E F G H I J K L P Q M philosophy science. No, it's not. Ah, sorry. Here we go, philosophy. So just limit it to only philosophy research area, and then this will only be article, philosophy articles written on nuclear weapon published in Project Muse. Project Muse tends to be a little bit more critical, uh, a little bit more continental philosophy, whereas JSTOR tends to be a little bit more analytic philosophy. Both have both, but yeah, sure. Um, Project Muse is a little bit more continental philosophy, and JSTOR is a little bit more analytic philosophy. I just realized, some of you probably don't know what the analytic is, kind of analytic philosophy is. Okay, so, would you like to explain? I don't know, I was going to say, I don't know. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So we have examples of people who do not know. So, um, broadly speaking, I'm going to oversimplify the history of philosophy. I apologize. Um, never mind. I don't have a whiteboard mark. Oh, wait, am I back on Um, no, I don't. Okay, well, uh, in... Uh, the philosophical tradition before Kant, there were sort of two main schools of Western thought. There were the rationalists, people like Descartes, Spinoza, um, Leibniz, and there were the empiricists, people like David Hume, John Locke, Bishop Barclay. And the empiricists were very sort of focused on science and the empirical world, and they thought that we had to use sort of experience and observation to understand things. And there were the rationalists, who thought it was all based on sort of there were innate ideas and by pure reason and thought alone we could come to a sort of meaningful philosophical truth. And the empiricists tended to be mostly in the UK, or like so England and Scotland and Ireland and places like that. And the rationalists tend to be mostly in Europe, France and Germany. And then, according to Kant, the two traditions culminate in him. So they sort of come together and he synthesizes the two into the true philosophy. Um, and honestly, because most philosophers took Kant to be the central figure of modern philosophy, and maybe the most important philosopher ever, since most people sort of agreed about that, it didn't mean everyone responding to him. And so out of these two traditions, we had the empiricist tradition come down into Kant and then come out and sort of come the analytic philosophical tradition, which tends to be the sort of philosophy done in the UK, Australia, and the United States. And on the other side, we had the rational tradition come in and come out in the continental tradition, which tends to be the sort of philosophy done in Europe, in particular Germany and France. So people like Foucault, um, are all continental philosophers. They tend to be much more sort of socially critical, a lot more concerned with sort of social power dynamics and ways to sort of come to understand truth. I tend to find that philosophy a lot more sort of poetic and less precise. So they're a lot less concerned with sort of giving very precise definitions of concepts and working through conceptual analysis and tend to be much more involved in sort of answering big questions in big ways. Whereas analytical philosophers tend to be very like answering small questions in small ways, trying to make sort of very precise developments. Um, and so Project Muse tends to be a little more continental and critical and power structure-y. Yep. So just, uh, sorry, I just wanted to review uh, empiricists and nationalists one yeah. because I'm not sure I really understood it. Yeah, so empiricists are people who thought like, hey look, we come to know the world by observation and what we see and touch and hear. And rationalists thought we have like innate ideas, like math is something we learn without studying the world and can sort of be done purely in the mind. There's obviously a lot more detail, right, to discuss, uh, and this is not a lecture on history of philosophy, so I'm not going to go into detail, but yeah. Um, who are some good, like, analytic philosophers and some other common philosophers? Yeah, so, so the main analytic philosophers are people like Bertrand Russell, 
um, quine, um, sorry. Uh, people like Richard Russell, uh, Quine, Wittgenstein, Elizabeth Anscombe, who I study, Jacob Niebel. Um, he's not famous, but <laughs> an analytic philosopher. Um, and continental philosophers and people like Heidegger, Foucault, uh, Agamben, people like that. Yep. Um, okay. So here we are, uh, and we've looked through these various articles. <laughs> And we have done a bunch of research. We found philosophy-ish articles or philosophy-leaning articles that talk about the topic. In general, what you want from these are sort of very principled approaches to the topic. Things that make very general universal claims about why something would be wrong. In particular, what you want is you want a sort of argument which it doesn't seem to contingently depend on how these things apply right now. That's a good mark for a good sort of philosophical position. The argument doesn't seem to depend contingently on particular relations between countries, for instance. The with the nuclear weapons topic, a not very philosophical act would be like, currently right now, countries are trying to proliferate, and so it's a good idea if we get rid of nuclear weapons to lower nuclear tensions. That's something that could very easily change. You could imagine a little change in certain ways which make that argument no longer true. What you want with a philosophical position is really a position that it'd be very hard to imagine the world being different in such a way where this argument would no longer be plausible or true. And so that means it becomes less dependent on sort of empirical evidence. It's a more principle-based position, which means the philosophical arguments from your framework are going to take a greater degree of priority. Now, the ideal situation is when you're reading these articles, the authors will actually just tell you what ethical theory they appeal to. And this will actually be very, very common. So um, if I were doing this search, right, I might type in nuclear weapons and deontology, for instance. And then I might actually find articles like deterrence and deontology which will be precisely about deontological theories and deterrence, um, or nuclear deterrence and deontology, or moral and political necessity of nuclear disarmament and applied ethical analysis, which will probably talk about deontology, nuclear deterrence and self-defense, nuclear intentions. This is a great article. Really confusing, but really interesting. Um, ooh, risks, natural defense, and nuclear I didn't know Armstrong like that. I might have to check that out later. Okay. Um, but yeah, so you want, right, so you, often you'll be able to find actual philosophers who defend that topic from a deontological standpoint, or a utilitarian standpoint, or a virtue ethical standpoint. And those become the easiest cases to write in. Because what you do is you look into the article, and then as you're reading the article, you look for footnotes in which the author says which version of deontology they're defending. And they'll often just have footnotes that are like, uh, the sort of deontology as defended by this person. And then you instantly know how you're going to write your framework, you just follow the footnotes to that broader position. So often in these articles, they will actually cite the philosophical thinkers who they rely on for the underlying ethical theories. And then your case becomes super cohesive and super nice because you're appealing to the exact thinkers that your authors are appealing to in developing this. So when you're doing philosophy research, it's very, very important, especially if you find philosophically focused articles, to read through the footnotes because those footnotes will often tell you exactly who to card for writing the framework itself. Sometimes it won't, though. Sometimes it'll just be like, I'm appealing to general deontology. And then you face the question, OK, so how am I going to write the deontology framework? And to do that, you're going to need to research the theory itself. Now, the first thing you do is you go back to Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and type in that ethical theory. So suppose, well, let's not do, someone pick an ethical theory that we want to look up. Someone shout out. Consequentialism. All right, consequentialism. Consequentialism. I don't think I'm spelling this right, let's see. Oh, I did. Nice. So we've gone to consequentialism, and the first thing you would do is you would read through the San Francisco Pedia philosophy article on the subject. Right, so it'll talk about classical consequentialism, what is consequentialism, what is the good, the dominant is close, the consequentialism, which consequences act with respect to consequentialism, consequences of what, consequences for whom, arguments of consequentialism. So you'll read through all of that. The best thing about this is that in the argument section, there will be very clear citations for exactly who makes these various arguments. So I can look up the Kagan article and find this argument convincing. Or if I find this article convincing, I could look up these people. Or if I find this article convincing, I could look up Sidgwick. Or this, I could look up Hare. Or Senator Armstrong. Or Sam McCord. 
Um, so they'll just tell you, right, like these are all, all I've got is the defend utilitarianism, but consequentialism in various forms. And this is the all right, so standard encyclopedia of philosophy is written by professional philosophers, like these are the central arguments of philosophy, they tend to be the best arguments. And so it's a really easy way to speed up your research, because rather than being all the consequentialists, you just find who the people who are hired to write the Sam Encyclopedia of Philosophy article think are the most important people to read. And it becomes really, really easy to find arguments for your ethical theory. Like Hassani, who for some reason never used in debate, even though I'm a solid argument for utilitarianism, to the extent it can be such a thing, since it's a ridiculous ethical theory. Uh, the other thing that's really useful here is the bibliography. So the bibliography in Sam Encyclopedia of Philosophy is just wonderful, and is where I get a lot of, I, like, I'm currently writing a paper on constraints in ethical philosophy. I just use the sample of your philosophy to like decide exactly what I was going to read. Um, it just saves you so much research time because you find really, really precise, specific stuff to look at. Um, some other places to look for good overviews. So, uh, Standard Encyclopedia of Philosophy is nice. It's probably the best general overview source out there. There's also the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, it's not as good. Just as a matter of objective fact, I don't think it's as good. It does tend to be a little bit easier. So the Standard Encyclopedia of Philosophy tends to be a little bit more technical. It's really written for philosophers. The in that, uh, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a little easier. Uh, sometimes not as complicated, but also I don't think quite as high quality. But still a nice place to look uh, for stuff. Another thing that you should check out is this website called um, Philosophy Compass, where the Philosophy Compass is basically it's like if you were to ask a philosopher, hey, can you write an article that would help other philosophers who don't know about the subject matter get into the literature fast? So, for instance, uh, we could just take a debate topic, right? So. If I were to search uh, this journal right, for um, civil disobedience, right, they'll probably have an article. Yep, so an article on civil disobedience. And this is just an article written by an expert on the philosophy of civil disobedience, which is basically just like an overview to the literature. So if we read the abstract, um, we talk about the definition of civil disobedience in section one. And then section two is devoted to the main objections against and theorist defense of civil disobedience. So if you were to then read this, right, like part two, which just provides you the main overview to the main philosophical arguments on the topic. And what's most valuable about this is it'll have a really, really good bibliography at the end. Um, if you hit, hit work cited. In general, philosophy research is easiest if you can just find someone else who wrote a bibliography with all the best articles to read on the subject. Because there are people out there whose full-time job is to read everything that's written about this and decide what's worth reading. And a lot of them create bibliographies which are like overuse of literature, and it just makes your life so much easier if you can find professional curated bibliographies. On the subject of professional curated bibliographies, another great bibliography to look at is the Oxford Bibliographies Philosophy. So Oxford has these Oxford Bibliographies in Philosophy. The reason I don't tend to focus this at the top of the lecture is very few of you actually have access to this. Um, I know very few high schools that subscribe to the Oxford Bibliography of Philosophy. If you go to a college campus, you'll have access to it because like, all the colleges subscribe to it, but high schools don't. I find most high schools do subscribe to JSTOR. You all have things like kind of online, SSR is free, Sam Encyclopedia is philosophy is free, but this is something that you generally won't have. But is just super. Oh, wait, hang on, I'm in the wrong place. Um, no, I don't want the printed book. I want the. Here we go. Um, so what it is, is uh, suppose, uh, pick a different ethical theory, I think consequential, something else. Deontology. Deontology. So let's go to D. I'm sure they have a deontology article. Um, uh, do they not have a deontology article? That's not possible. No. <coughs> Hang on. I, I cannot believe the Oxford Bibliography do not have an article on. They have something on dialethianism. <laughs> they have a whole thing on Dutch book arguments. I love Dutch book arguments, but there's no way they have a whole thing. Oh, boy. Hang on. We're getting to the bottom of this. No, what? <laughs> um. I refuse to believe 
Maybe search con. I mean, I'm sure it'll be a thing on con. Um, that's. Yeah, like con. Okay, look at how many articles it has just on con. There's no way it doesn't have something. <laughs> What? Okay, maybe it's like utilitarianism and the anthology? Hang on. Wait. They don't have any- <laughs> <laughs> I don't- <laughs> Yeah, I got the environmental ethics one too. There isn't a different- What? Brad, I said there. We're in the philosophy. Right? I see the philosophy. I mean, how do you run a philosophy website not having one day on YouTube? I don't know. It's like the only philosophy that everyone in this room knows. Yeah. That and YouTube. Do they have YouTube? No. Hang on. We just, it's, we just, maybe they have like a giant one on ethics. Hang on. They don't have YouTube. Let's see if you go to ethics. I think this is the way. Kind of philosophy is I mean, no. So, the honest bibliographies are amazing, but. So for some reason this like link is not these links are not ready, but normally if this was working, I could just click on this link and it would take me to like a curated list of articles, the best articles on Kantian ethics, or the best articles on natural law theory, or the best articles on the priority of the right over the good, or the best articles on age of relativity, or on constraints and paradox and ontology, etc. And it will be really nice because again, it's just someone who's like, these are the best articles, these are the most worthwhile things to read. But what's even nicer 
is this will be like a little overview, which will often tell you like what the articles sort of say and give you an overview to what like you're about to read, which can help you orient yourself a little more easily. Uh, so this is really nice. Um, a couple of other things. Um, for people, let's go back here for a second. Now we'll go on to gen more general philosophy, not just the topic, right? It's useful to, you know, uh, research uh, some category, right? Like maybe you are really interested in a particular in virtue ethics, right? So you go to like the virtue ethics category, and then you could see agent-based virtue ethics, ethics of care, you know, monistic virtue ethics, holistic virtue ethics, sentimentalist virtue ethics, varieties of virtue ethics, and you can get all these sort of various things. Um, and what's also nice is that you all can create a Phil People account. So Phil People is Facebook for philosophers. Um, like I said, it's the online community of philosophers. Um, and you can just create an account. And that's not super useful for you because you're not philosophers, but you can like friend philosophers, which is cool, and like call them. And then if like Cause God's like, hey y'all, I'm working on this article, I'm gonna put up a draft, what do you think? You can like get a sneak peek at it, which is kind of cool. Um, but the thing that's actually useful is when you create an account, you can uh, sign up for weekly email updates with any new articles published in your areas of interest. And so you can just select your areas of interest for whatever, right? so like if you want, to, if you read a consequentialist frame of case or whatever, you could just select your area of interest for arguments for consequentialism. And then anytime this editor says like, oh, I'm adding a new article into the arguments of consequentialism section, it'll send you an email each week with all the new articles for arguments of consequentialism, and it'll just make your life really easy. Um, these are not always the most universally curated lists, so like some are really reliably updated and some are not so reliably updated, uh, but still nice. Yep. So where exactly do we sign up the email list? Uh, fill, so you go to fillpeople.org, yeah. and then you just create an account. Uh, so you sign in. Um, so uh, you can create an account or sign in register with Facebook. So if you just create an account, you like put in your name, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you confirm that you're not a robot. And then the next couple of pages would be like, sign up for uh, like your areas of specialty. And you select your areas of specialty, which is like what you're interested in. And then you can select it to give you email updates anytime there's new articles in that area. And so it's super fun. Plus you can all like follow me on Phil People. And if I like update my profile, you can like, ooh, watch the working on this paper. Because um, you know, what you always wanted was to be able to have a Facebook but only with philosophers. Yes. So uh, now you can. Is there a philosopher only dating site? Oh my god. Oh, we're just like, oh, not. Genius. Um, oh, you want to introduce me to that? Uh, yeah, uh, so this is nice. Um, fill people, reliable source, uh, Project Muse, uh, Philosophy Compass. Uh, a couple of other useful things for research. So, obviously, I can't talk about everything I want in this lecture. We've only got about uh, 15 more minutes. Uh, but still, there's some things that you should definitely know. But before I forget, uh, who here has ever used college library research guides? Okay, only one of you. You should all be using these things. There are people whose professional job is to teach other people how to research more effectively, and they're called college librarians, and they're very, very good at what they do, for the most part. No doubt there's some bad ones, but I've never met one. I've never met someone who's bad at being a college librarian who's a college librarian. I have met some who are probably bad people, that's because most people are bad people. Uh, that's a separate issue. But so like, let's take an example, right? Like, um, let's just start with my school for, that's not useful, Florida. Florida State University Library Research Guides. Um, and so guides my subject. And this can be really useful. So like anytime like, I'm helping my debate, I'm like, we need economics research. I'm like, I don't know how to research economics. I'll go to like the Yale or the Harvard or the Florida State Library Research Guide on economics and just like figure out how do librarians say to research these things. But since we're doing a philosophy specific one, you can come over here to philosophy. Uh, you can click philosophy. You can go to philosophy. And then I'll say, looking for journal articles, check out Phil Papers or Philosopher's Index. Ooh, I forgot about Philosopher's Index. I'll talk about that one as well. Uh, handbooks and bibliographies, Oxford bibliographies, Oxford handbooks, Oxford Scholarship Online, Encyclopedias and References, Stamp Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and National Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Oxford English Dictionary. So, you know, nice stuff, all helpful. Um, books, primary sources, websites, they're good to go here. Uh, we can get selected websites in philosophy. Um, there isn't same sources, just stuff of that sort, which can be useful. Uh, similarly, if we go to Yale uh, Research Guides, or Stanford Research Guides, or any of these sort of top schools that have really good libraries, they will have really nicely curated um, philosophy research guides. So we can go. Wait, this is fascinating. Yale has a research guide on ancient philosophy, philosophy, Plato's Phaedo specifically, which. <laughs> Good book, but I don't know why they have an entire research guide on how to research it. And Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. 
They only showed you like two random books that are like an entire research guide. But anyway, so we go to the general philosophy research guide, right? And we'll see other things. So philosophy links, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Butler's Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, Encyclopedia of Philosophy Second Edition, Oxford Bibliographies, Oxford References Online, Philosophy Index, Fell Papers. Uh, if you click on like find articles, they'll recommend see JSTOR philosophy journals. Makes similar recommendations. Project News, Philosophy, Religion and Philosophy Collection, Wiley, Black Philosophy. Ooh, I didn't even mention these. This is another good one if you have access to Wiley. Um, Oxford Bibliographies and Philosophy, Humanities Index. So this will just provide you other sources for that same sort of research advice. Yeah. Oh, uh, which one of these are free? So for research guides on college libraries are all free. Yeah. Um, which of these sources are free? Uh, a lot of the things like the encyclopedias are free. Uh, things through Oxford are never free. Oxford charges for everything. And then the databases mostly are not free. JSTOR, the, JSTOR is not free, but most high schools have access to it. SSRN is free, um, and Phil Papers is free, but Phil Papers will often just link you to the actual article, and then you have to have access to the article through something else. So what Phil Papers allows you to do is it allows the author to upload their own archive version of the article, but a lot of publishers won't let you do that, and so if the publishers allowed it, they have an archive. Um, and so Phil Papers is nice in that respect. Um, yes. Uh, Uh, apparently, yeah, let me just log into this quickly so I can all show you the other thing. I don't actually know. Oh, you know what? No, we're on the top of it. I don't need to log in. Um, I can probably just. Uh, it was Phosphorus Index, right? Phosphorus Index. Um, this is also a really nice thing. Um, which is, uh, it's an online bibliography in philosophy. And it does the same sort of things that we've been talking about. Um, but I never. Mm, yeah, let's let's try to go to UCLA, UCLA Library Philosophy Guide. Philosophy you subscribe to UCLA Library, they probably are Philosophers and X. Um, what is this? I don't understand. This is different than when I log in via yeah, FSU. Deontology. Hmm. I mean, these all look good. Sheffler's all good for deontology. But Sheffler's not a deontologist. Oh, holy, by the way, it's good stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, can deontologists be on? No, why would deontologists be moderate? Deontologists hold the line. You cannot tell a lie that the heavens may fall. Ooh, David Martin, uh, David Martin, Piers Rowling. These are two of my professors at FSU. Um, anyway, sorry, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, well, Ross's index. I guess. ProQuest now lets me search. Oh, wait, here we go. Can I give a quick no? I guess the Floss of the Next has kind of changed how that works, maybe? I don't. Well, now back here. But like. No, I don't want to buy Floss of the Next. I already want to have it. Full text. Okay. Well, apparently, Fossil Index now looks different than how I remember it. Yeah. Um, if you find something on Phil Papers and you're not able to like get access to it, uh, could you just like look it up on Google Scholar and yep. find like a bullet copy? Yeah. So that's what I tend to do. If it's not available on Phil Papers, I put it into Google Scholar. If it's not available on Google Scholar, then I message a friend I have at a different school and see if they can find it for me. Um, but you tend to be able to do Google Scholar. If not, but like during the year, you all can just like email me, like Marshall, I can't find this article, um, and I'll be like, well, I have access to college databases, so let me try. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, no, but plugging Google Scholar is a pretty reliable way to get it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Philosophy Index is just like another one of these really comprehensive, uh, annotated bibliographies, which organize all the information for you nicely. Um, yeah. Uh, Phil Papers, like I said, I think it would be a philosophy, all of this stuff. So, um, 
Now, you're researching philosophy, you've got these various positions. The next thing that you need to realize is what good philosophical casing looks like from a sort of research standpoint. And here's my general recommendation. I don't like philosophy blocks. I don't like things like answers to deontology, answers to utilitarianism, answers to virtue ethics. And the reason I don't like these is because when I see debaters use these, they always read arguments that also answer their own value criteria, like systematically. Um, I tend to think that framework debate is debate that works best with files, where you just have your deontology file, and then you have your version of deontology and how it interacts with other sort of frameworks. We should always be thinking about this stuff as you know comparative. And so you should always be writing these files as you just have your day on file. And your day on file has answers to virtue ethics, has answers to utilitarianism, but always from a deontological perspective. And so what you generally want to do is just be reading philosophers who make these objections to other deontologists. And this is really easy to do because so many of these authors are responding to one another from within a particular tradition or within a particular perspective. It's generally quite easy to find articles that do this sort of interaction. But that's how you should be thinking about what you're trying to do with framework today. You're trying to build files which defend this sort of overall position, and not anything else. A um, couple of last points. Sometimes it can be difficult to find really good substantive philosophical positions on a topic. When this happens, it can be really sad. There are some things you can do to try to speed up um, the research process. So is anyone here already familiar with proximity searches? Oh, yeah, it's when you search like around. Yeah. Like, so, like, one thing you could do is if you really have any problem with topics, nuclear weapons uh, around 30 Kant. And this will now only produce results in which the word Kant is used within 30 words of nuclear weapons. And so, it'll only be people who are talking basically in the same paragraph about nuclear weapons and Kant. This can be useful. I never recommend doing this at first. The reason I don't recommend doing this at first is because what you have is you have to be like, I'm just going to read Kant on every single topic. And then what they do is every time the topic comes up, the first thing they do is look up Kant within 15 words of the topic area and then find somebody who says something tangentially related and tries to make that their case. That's not good philosophical case. Good philosophical case is contention first case, and we just find what the truest contention level principle argument is and then build a framework around it. But if you're just like really desperate and can't find those articles, this can be a way to actually find something which relates to a case you already know. It's very easy to use this as a way to cheat and not actually do proper research and just find like a way to use an old framework you already have and gerrymander it with the contention that you want to write. And that produces not nearly as good framework debate, but it is a possibility. And it's something that you can use if you are really struggling with finding good principled arguments on the topic. Um, other things to look at, um, on a lot of these topics it can be useful to look at people who might not be philosophers, but might have sort of more principled or philosophical approaches to topics. In particular, I will often work, look at um, theologians, who will sometimes have arguments that you can adapt to more philosophical positions, and uh, things like the Catholic Church, or an organization of bishops, or um, a group of mosques in New York City who releases a publication on this subject. In general, religious organizations tend to have more principled approaches. Sometimes like think tanks like Cato, so um, Cato Institute uh, is super libertarian, right? And you can often find very like principled libertarian-ish arguments here. And so sometimes a way you can also do this research is to try to find people who have very principled approaches to issues and see what they say. And often by researching there, you'll find principled arguments which you can then fit with a sort of good philosophical theory. Here's the thing, right? Like most religious people don't have very good philosophical work. Right? I say this as a very devout Christian. Right? Most religious people don't know what they're talking about. Right? Most people don't know what they're talking about, but religious people especially, it seems like. Right? Nevertheless, they tend to make principled arguments. And then you can find real philosophers who are going to explain why those principles would matter. Or similarly for um, groups like, you know, libertarians. Like, they're not to be trusted. Libertarians, very sophomore philosophy in my opinion. Nevertheless, um, right, you can find those sort of principles and then retrofit it with some more robust philosophical positions. Uh, and so this can be, so finding groups who would take sort of very principled stands on things can be another nice way to try to find contentual arguments which you can then use for this sort of stuff. Um, in particular, topics that have to do with like property rights or redistribution or equality or economics things. 
Um, looking at Catholic social theology is also the best way to find sort of nice principled contentious level arguments. Even if you don't read a Catholic social theology framework, they just tend to make very principled arguments about issues of economics. Because uh, like the Catholic theologians have been discussing this for like 400 years, and they're all based in Aquinas' philosophy, and this is really nice sort of principled stuff. Same with bioethics. On the bioethics topic, uh, you always start with the Catholics, because the Catholics have the most sort of principled approach, and then you can take more classical deontologists and fit it in, because it's kind of hard just by sort of robust Catholic double effect, but you could fit, you could use their sort of very principled contentious level arguments and then fit it with a more classical deontological framework. Uh, any other nice hints for speeding up the philosophy research uh, process? Um, yeah. Um, I, if you're running like a philosophy position on maybe the, like Japan topic that gets selected, um, would you, uh, when researching uh, reference papers that have like Japan and deontology in it, or like or like uh, things that talk about that specific legislation? Or yeah. Um, so. This was, I was just researching that topic last session, um, and what I was finding was that if you like do the like, JSTOR philosophy only articles, if you type in like Japan Article 9, you find like nothing, but if you type in like Japan pacifism, you find a lot of stuff, even if it's sort of specific to Japan. And so often it's finding the sort of search terms which people will talk about in this context, but there was like interesting articles about how like Japan's Article 9, or Japan's pacifistic constitution, iterated sort of like Kantian themes or things like this. Right? Uh, you just often had to use different sort of terminology than what you would often use. Um, that said, one of the nice things about philosophy-focused debate is most of the philosophical political philosophy, it's not like it says like Western countries have these obligations. No, it says governments have these obligations. And so you can often generalize this general arguments of pacifism work really well uh, on that topic, even though it's not going to end up being specific. And so given the sort of very principled nature of these, right, like, if you want to make an economics argument, it better be Japan-specific evidence. Right. Or if you want to have a like, you know, self-defense argument, it better be Japan specific. But if you're making a principle argument about pacifism being good and violence being bad, it really need not be quite as Japan specific because it's going to be a general principle that's going to apply regardless. Um, any last questions about this sort of stuff? I always really dislike teaching the research modules because it's boring. Right. Like most of my modules are like fun and interesting. This one's boring because research is kind of boring. But, um, yeah, these are ways to find more sort of principled, philosophically sort of stuff. Uh, it speeds up the research process a lot, and you should use these tips and techniques. Yep. Do you have another, another module on like, just field debate in general? Uh, most of my modules are on field debate of some sort or another. I know I'm tomorrow, no, Friday morning, I'm teaching the advanced philosophy topic analysis, for instance, and I think I have some other stuff next week. Um, but yeah, you can also always find me during soccer hours and be like, Marshall, explain philosophy debate in general. Um, and I can do what I can. Um, yeah, so anything else? Philosophy is really hard to, oh, I, I'll just end with this. Philosophy is extraordinarily hard to read, right? Good philosophy is very, very difficult. And this is because of something known as the Hermeneutic Circle. Is anyone here familiar with the Hermeneutic Circle? The Hermeneutic Circle. All right, only one of you. This is the general idea of the hermeneutic circle. To understand the whole of something, you understand the individual part. But to understand the part, you have to understand the whole. Let's take a simple example. If my mom says, hey Marshall, can you come here right now? I'm like, uh-oh, what did I do? I don't know, something bad. But if my friend says, hey Marshall, can you come here right now? I'm like, sure, what do you need? In other words, they say the same thing, but I interpret them differently. Why? Because I have a different understanding of my friend's relationship to me, who my friend is, than my mom's relationship to me, who my mom is. And so I use this different to understand the context of what they're saying. I interpret the individual action related to the other as a whole. But my understanding of who they are as a whole also depends on my understanding of the individual interaction we've had. So there's this constant back and forth. The understanding of the whole of a thing depends on the understanding of the parts of it. The understanding of the parts of it depends on the understanding of the whole. This is just a circle. Luckily, it's a sort of fruitful circle, I think, right? It's not like a vicious circle. But it doesn't mean you have to be really careful. Because if you try to just read philosophy, just reading like as quickly as you can, finding cards, you're not going to understand it well, and you're going to miscut stuff. I see philosophy debate miscut more often than any other type of debate because it's very difficult to understand what the whole article is doing unless you're reading it fairly slowly and carefully. So if you're carding something just for like carding it as like an answer to a case, I think you should really read the article a minimum of two times. And if you're using it in your case, I think you should really read the article a minimum of three times. I think it's just like necessary. Like I haven't been doing this for 13 years. Right? I've like, my full-time job is reading philosophy and writing about it. 
and I have to read philosophy multiple times if I want to understand it. You all definitely do, because you do not know philosophy nearly as well as I do, and philosophy is just super difficult. Um, so it really just takes, you, you are better rewarded by reading a couple of things really slowly and carefully than you are reading a whole bunch of things quickly in terms of your ability to actually explain and articulate the kind of positions later on in actual debate rounds. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess during your debate career, Yeah. Um, how many, like if you were cutting like a full of, uh, like philosophy case, how many cards like were you cutting? Like what went one? I guess I don't really understand the question. Or I mean, like, how easy was it for for you to find like philosophy research and card and make a case out of it, like, in your head? Um. So like at first, it took me a really really long time. So like the first ever like super philosophical case I ever wrote was for TOC my junior year. It was this long Kant case, and I had to read Kant's groundwork six times before I was felt like I could caught it because I didn't think I understood it the first five times I read it. And the sixth time I thought I understood it and then caught in it, but now looking back at that case, I did not understand it. I thought I did, I did not. Um, and that case was like two contention articles that were just like, look, double effects that you can't use sanctions, and then I read Kant six times and eventually caught in it. And it just had this massive file, which was like the entire groundwork cut into like 17 cards, which I had as my front lines to everything. Um, so that was a pretty, it was a small number of cards, but. Um, Took me a really long time to write. Later, like my senior year when I actually got good at this stuff, I might have, you know, fairly long files with like fairly detailed answers to various other philosophies and things, and it would go a lot faster, and they might be, you know, 100, 150 card files. Um, uh, yeah. Do you have any tips for like reading philosophy, like taking notes or like? Yeah. Um, so the first thing to do is to, um, how to read. Philosophy, what's that guy's name? The guy at NYU, uh, Pryor. So Jim Pryor has this guideline to reading philosophy website, which is just pretty good to read, um, and just like good steps to reading philosophy. So check that out. My general recommendation is you read it through once, just skimming to try to understand the position as a whole. Then you read it through a second time, and your goal the second time is not necessarily to understand the individual arguments, but just to dive them out where the main breaks in the paper are. So what I'll try to do is have like overarching brackets. Like all of this is one part, and then it's subdivided into argument here, argument here, argument here. And so I just try to like break the article up into parts. Like break down like this is where complete argument is, this is where complete argument. Those two complete arguments make one bigger argument. And just try to identify the structure of the article. And then the third time I read through, and this time I'm actually reading for sort of content and understanding the individual argument. Um, but I think if you attend carefully to sort of structure the second time, it'll make it a lot easier to understand the overall argument when you go to break it down. So that's sort of my general approach. Um, and then read slowly. Um, how, like, what kind of philosophy can you read in lay tournaments? Philosophy debate is great for lay tournaments. Um, right, things like John Rawls or Nozick or Immanuel Kant or social contract theory. I think philosophy debate is one of the most portable, right, like, Philosophy and statistics debate are like the two sort of fairly technical, difficult things in debate to be really good at, but that have a huge payoff in local debate uh, and late debate. Um, but it's the same thing like John Rawls, professor emeritus at Harvard University, and author of the seminal text, Theory of Justice, argues that as truth is the first virtue of thought, so justice is the first virtue in just right? Like, like Parents have heard of John Rawls and Robert Nozick and John Locke and Immanuel Kant. They knew these are sort of great thinkers, and you can sort of leverage that credibility thing. And if you can give really nice explanations of it, you can do really well. I remember like some of my favorite comments I've on ballots I got were from parents who were like, "You reminded me of my own philosophy professor," and like high school was like, "Oh, that's so nice." <laughs> um, and then you give me really nice speaks. So I feel like philosophy is one of the things like deep principle positions. Most philosophers are writing sort of core ideas that are accessible to other people. Um, the way a lot of framework is run in, L in LD right now is total nonsense. But that's, but that's not because, like, it, it's like super complicated and way too complex for it to explain to judges. But that's not because lay judges can't understand philosophy. It's because the circuit debaters read arguments that are too complex for debate. Right? It's not like it's too complex for lay debate. Like, the, the frameworks I see in debate, I do not understand. I am plausibly one of the best, if not the best, judge for a philosophy, intense philosophy debate. And I have no idea what's going on in philosophy debates that I watch. I cannot tell. The fact that I don't know what's going on means these arguments are too complicated and read too quickly. Right? There's just no excuse 
that I cannot follow an analytic velocity debate anyway. Um, so yes, velocity debate as it's done on the circuit is not helpful for lay debate. But that's because velocity debate as it's done on the circuit is not helpful for any debate, because it's not debate. It's just people reading cards and not understanding what the other person is saying. Um, Velocity debate has to be slower than other types of debate, and it has to be more principled, and has to be a little bit more careful uh, if you want to do it well. Uh, so I think. All right, uh, you can hand to mentor. Thank you, Mark. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.